Welcome to The Plant Report, a radio show that educates about the green world one plant at a time. The Plant Report is a new educational resource about plants, herbal medicine, ethnobotany, and the human-plant relationship. Listen to our podcast, read our blog, watch our videos, and learn from experts and the plants. The Plant Report is a project of Sustainable World Radio and is hosted by Jill Cloutier. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report because every plant has a story. Our plant today is hops and our guest is Acadia Tucker. Acadia is a regenerative farmer, climate activist, and author. Her books are a call to action to gardeners everywhere to get growing. Acadia is the author of many books, including Growing Good Food, A Citizen's Guide to Backyard Carbon Farming, and her latest book, Tiny Victory Gardens, Growing Good Food Without a Yard. Acadia lives in Maine with her farm dog, Nimbus, where she grows hops and raises perennials in her backyard. Welcome to The Plant Report, Acadia. It's so good to talk with you again. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, And I'm so excited to talk about hops. Um, When I think about hops, I just like take a deep breath and relax because I think of (laughs) beer, (laughs) which is like the only alcohol I kind of like and um, which I really like. And also relaxation because hops is so good for our nervous system and just relaxing. And so it must be really fun to be a hops grower. It, you know, it is really fun. Uh, I, I truly do enjoy the aroma. It just it just makes it puts me in a happy place. Um, I would like to say, though, that hops themselves aren't necessarily the cuddliest of plants. <laughs> they have these little bit uh, of a spiky nature to them, kind of like you would find on cucumbers or maybe a squash plant. Um, and they, they do like to find you and wrap around you. And when you move away quickly, they can kind of leave a little bit of a rash behind and we call it hot burn. They're plants that bite is what I call them. Yes, yes. Wow, interesting. And is and pl- I think hops are a vine or a bine is what I learned in my research. And is are those little sticky parts on the stem? Is that part of them holding onto things? You know what, that's a, that's a very good question. I know the official um, term uh, when you use bine versus mm-hmm. a vine with a B, or a V yeah. rather, a bine is a vine <laughs> without <laughs> tendrils. So uh-huh. tendrils are usually like those little hooks that help, like say peas that help them climb up a trellis. Um, and hops do not have that. They grow more like beans. So they have the top of the plant growth that moves in kind of a counterclockwise circle up its its trellis. So once it's actually trained, meaning you just kind of wrap it a few times around the cord, it will just grow up the trellis all on its own. Wow. Plants are so smart. Oh, there's some, if I, I suggest anybody who's listening this to kind of uh, YouTube uh, hop growing you know, sped up and they really look alive. Like they look like they have intelligence and they know what they're doing. Um, And they're, you know, it's, it's pretty miraculous. So we're all on the same page. Hops is the name of the plant, but the Latin name, which I hope I can say this is humulus lupulus. Is that right? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Try and say that five times. I'm not even going to (laughs) try. And I I guess the name hops came from hoppin, an Anglo-Saxon word for climb. Yes, that's very interesting. And I know that, you know, the the lupulin, that the mm-hmm. hop cone, which is kind of like the flower of the hop, um, is kind of this sticky, resinous, almost pollen-like um, resin substance. And that's what gives it the aroma and its stickiness. Um, and so when brewers are, you know, smelling a hop that they might want to put in a beer, that's kind of where all of this essence and aroma and bitters and kind of flavor comes from. Interesting. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to learn more about this. That is hops are one plant I have never grown. So this will be really fun to learn about it. And I just wanted to mention that hops are in the cannabis or cannabinaceae. Is that how you'd say it? Yeah. Yeah. So hops are in the cannabinaceae family, but (laughs) don't get your hopes up for those of you who like to... um, (laughs) vibe it's not going to get you high hops will not get you high in the way of the famous um, member of the that family but it is 
very relaxing, right? It has relaxing qualities, which we'll learn about. Yes, it's very, very soothing. And so Acadia hops is an ancient plant. It's been around for such a long time and was in the first century AD. It was described as a salad plant in Egypt, which is so long ago. And then it's been used in breweries in the 14th century in the Netherlands. And in the 16th century in England, there was great opposition to adding it to beer. And I guess there was a petition to the parliament that said, we don't want to use this wicked weed and it will endanger the people. So hops has a very <laughs> interesting history, a love and hate history, it sounds like, <laughs> or love and fear. I mean, all the, all the great things do, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's always resistance to good ideas. <laughs> and, and so do you have, want to add anything to the history of this interesting plant? I think, um, an interesting thing for people to 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 know about hops is that it is another one of those, you know, ancient crops that kind of grew out in the wild and, you know, people would stumble upon it, pick it up, feel that it was kind of scratchy, smell this amazing aroma and then just kind of figure out, well, what the heck do I do with this thing? And so over the years we've kind of domesticated the hop plant like we would, you know, um, you know, our canine friends or whatnot to kind of perform the way um, we see fit. Interesting. So really, and do you know where hops is native to? Because in probably six different sources online, there was a different place. Yeah. So I think, said. you know, yeah. there are a lot in like temperate North America, Eurasia, South America. So they, each of these um, regions have their own unique kind of native hop populations. And that's why it's kind of an, uh, you know, an interesting plant because there is a lot of genetic diversity to draw from um, and kind of play around in when you're breeding the, the plant. Oh, how fun. And so you really, you've written a lot about perennial plants and you grow a lot of perennials and is hops a perennial? Hops is definitely a perennial and that's what makes it a really fun crop to grow because, you know, you'd put all the work in up front, creating kind of permanent raised beds or mounds, which you then plant um, the root of the hop plant, which is called a rhizome. And from this rhizome, the binds grow out of. And once you have a nice established, you know, planting of them, each year when you go to harvest, you cut the binds down a couple inches above the ground, and then you kind of cover them with mulch. And then the next season, they'll just naturally start growing again. So it's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. So really, you're tilling the ground then in the beginning. And then after that, you don't have to, which is another great for climate change mitigation. Absolutely. So yeah, that's soil prep in, in part of your planting is really important because that's kind of the only time you'll be able to kind of change change the soil. You know, I always like to add in more compost. And then once that bed's established, each spring, what I'll do is I can kind of top dress it with another layer of compost and mulch just to kind of keep that organic matter content high. Uh, but the one of the most important things when you're thinking about kind of establishing a permanent hop bed is they really do good drainage uh, because they are a rhizome, a tuberous root they are susceptible to rot and decay pretty easily. So they really need kind of a good draining uh, bed. And that's why elevating them or growing them in mounds is kind of one of the best practices. Wow. And so do they need like a constant moisture level, but well-drained? How would they do in a dry climate like um, certain parts of the West? So they, they do pretty well in, in dry climates. I mean, most of the big hop fields are irrigated. It is just a necessity to kind of crank out the yield these farms have expected, but they are quite resilient plants. And if you're not um, reliant on how much they're going to produce, they really can be uh, left alone. And they're a pretty easy crop to grow if, if it's not your, you know, your main source of income. Um, and when you lived in Washington State, I think you worked on an organic farm and grew over 200 varieties of plants, from what I remember I, from our I did, last and it's, it's funny because hops was not one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to ask. What made you choose hops? <laughs> so when, when I moved back east, you know, uh, after I left my farm in Washington, I was really just kind of pining for you know, a, that agricultural experience, you know, I established my garden in my backyard and it was, you know, it's a very amazing place I like to spend. But in terms of, you know, more acreage agriculture, I was really just missing that experience. So 
I really kind of just looked looked at a few opportunities and I found this farm which is called the Hop Yard uh, just outside of Portland, Maine and I drove up in my old pickup truck that I couldn't turn off because it wouldn't turn on again. <laughs> And I just met I had with a car the... like that on Maui. <laughs> <laughs> I just met with the owner and, and, you know, we became really good friends and, um, we had, we complimented each other well in our skill sets. So it kind of just, uh, was a serendipitous, um, thing that happened. And, and I'm so, I'm so glad it did. Oh, that's great. And so do you enjoy growing hops? I do. It's, it's really a phenomenal plant. So we have about 10 acres and the thing that I love the most about it is each week you're there, it looks different because they grow at such an alarming rate. So, you know, they start at ground level and our trellises are about 25 feet high. Oh, wow. And they reach the top of that wire. So it's just, you know, you start the season off and you can see this wide expanse of these cedar poles. And, you know, by the end of August, you have just these green walls. It's like tunnel vision. You're walking in these rows. It's just, it's, it's really awe-inspiring. Wow, that is amazing. So hops is definitely a happy to be a live plant. Oh, yes, it is a thriver. And I, you know, I always tell people that if you sit down long enough, you can see it growing because it just grow. It just seems to grow so <laughs> fast. Oh, my gosh. And so it can grow that fast in one season then. Yes. It just shoots up. Wow, that's amazing. And I read that um, hops actually has separate male and female vines. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, no, it's actually what makes part of it such an interesting plant. And as a commercial hop grower, what we're focused on is the female plants. So the male plants do produce this type, this very small dainty flower. Um, but when introduced to the females, it can create seeds inside of that hop cone, which isn't something we're really after. So we do go through the yard regularly and find male plants vines and actually actively remove them because when a hot plant is stressed it can kind of switch from one to another mm. um, so yeah to maintain that quality in the yard we really don't want the male plants and we focus on keeping j just the female plants um, just to keep the quality of that cone a lot stronger and you can tell the difference because the male flower is smaller or how yeah. can you tell? So you can't, you can only tell when it starts to flower. Nothing overtly is different about one vine to the next, but when they start to what we call the burr stage. So when these little baby cones start to appear, they're kind of these like little fuzzy tufts. Um, they're quite, <laughs> quite cute. Um, so the female plants will produce these little fuzzy tufts where the male plant will produce more of a lacy small flower cluster. Mm. And it's quite obvious, you know, driving down the rows to spot them and you just can kind of just yank it right off the trellis and cut the bottom and we bring it to our compost heap. Mm, gotcha. And so um, do you think that growing hops at home is practical? Because it sounds like you need quite a lot of at least vertical space, right? Yeah. And you, I think it's absolutely practical. I think it's um, a really great way to kind of create uh, like a living privacy screen. Uh, because it does grow so quickly. So just because it can grow 25 feet doesn't mean it has to. So it's really going to climb up as tall as you'll allow it. And it can kind of flop over and kind of grow a little bit stronger up at the top. But, you know, people string the um, can string lines up, to, you know, towards the second story of their house. And they create like really cool like teepee structures out of the hops. Or they train it up the lattice around their porch and can kind of have like a completely screened in if you will um porch for the summer so it's because it grows so fast i think it makes it really attractive for the home grower because it's one instant gratification and two like i mentioned kind of it has that uh, privacy wall feature which can be really nice if you live in kind of a congested area oh that's great and you could also have a home brew garden absolutely <laughs> So, so it sounds like what you do is you plant in mounds or hills, and so you put the rhizome in, so it, it grows from rhizomes, so not so much from cuttings. Yeah, well, and it depends, you know, people that breed hops would grow them a lot differently than, say, a commercial farmer, but the number mm -hmm. one way it grows is you will, you can kind of receive rhizomes either in the mail or from your nursery or a seed store, um, and you plant it just like you would like a potato or something like that. You dig a hole underground and put in your rhizome. Uh, another popular way to grow plants is just to kind of buy baby hops. Mm 
So someone has already planted that rhizome, say, in a pot um, and has let the green start to grow. So you're kind of planting a gallon pot into the ground, maybe not being able to see the rhizomes because it's already you know, established and there's a root system. Uh, so those are the two most popular ways to kind of get your hops going. They don't mind being transplanted. No, they're they're actually pretty quite resilient, um, and they actually do ship quite well. Uh, we have a small uh, rhizome company associated with the farm, and we ship thousands and thousands of rhizomes across the country, and it's starting to pick up internationally as well. Uh, and we kind of just, you know, we keep them in cold storage until they're ready to ship. Uh, we make sure they're in a plastic bag with a little bit of moisture, and then we ship them as quickly as possible to their next destination. And a lot of times it might arrive to you with like a little bit of the gray fuzzy surface mold on them. Uh, And some people kind of get a little nervous, like, oh, my goodness, I I have a bad rhizome. But we always just encourage, you know, you just gently wash it off with water and you're good to go. Oh, that's so exciting. And so I think you mentioned this a bit um, a while back, but will hops grow pretty much? It sounds like it's found worldwide. So will it grow in pretty much any climate? It grows in a lot of climates. What I think the hardest climate for it to grow in is more of the tropical climates. Mm-hmm. Um, it really does like that kind of dormancy period uh, associated with more temperate climates that kind of have a cold season. So, you know, in my main climate, so we're anywhere from zone four to zone six, which is quite cold, they do fantastic. But then they also do, you know, where they truly thr- thrive is out west. Um, and that is more of a zone seven, seven, eight, or even nine. Uh, so you might not even get a hard frost on the ground, but there's still enough of a dormant period that they can get the rest they need to come back in full swing for the the summer season. Wow, that's so cool. And I assume it needs sun. It loves sun. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely can grow in partial shade, but they'll just grow a lot slower. Um, mm-hmm. And the comb production won't be nearly as uh, robust as if they were in full sun. And I would assume that the amount of sun and amount of water and the soil conditions would all affect the um, chemicals in the plant and affect the flavor. Absolutely. It's a lot like grapes in that sense. Um like we grow a popular variety called Cascade and out West it tastes completely different than what it tastes at our farm in Maine. And almost every hop variety is like that. Like it, it, a lot of it has to do with the sun and the soil, but it, it's amazing to me the range of just aroma and taste that one hop variety can have from one place to the next. It's quite remarkable. Wow, that's so, and that's what makes beer and wine different, right? All the time. Exactly, and that's you know, it's that's also been one of the challenges for um, some hop farms to convince brewers to use their hops. So we're obviously on the much smaller scale. Big hop farms are hundreds and hundreds of acres, um, and you know, like I said, not all Cascade is the same. So if we approach a brewer to purchase our hops, and they've gotten their hops traditionally from the West Coast it can be a little bit challenging to convince them to use our hops because they will change the taste of the beer. Mm -hmm. I think flour too. I interviewed a grain farmer. He was saying the same thing, that it can be different every year, the harvest. Yeah. And it is, it it is so funny, you know, when we talk about sustainable farming and small scale farming, it, it does, you know, as wonderful and as passionate as I am about it, it does present these unique challenges. It's kind of, you know, now we're relegated to small batch beers because our our taste of our crop does change because of the conditions that it's grown in. So it's it's kind of a, a push-pull situation, if you will. And it really is an impossible standard, if you think about it, in the natural world to have things stay exactly the same. Oh, yeah, it's completely unnatural. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Artificial flavoring, yes. Yeah. Natural <laughs> plants, no. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And so say that you have a backyard and you have the some space. Can you train hops to grow horizontally or would it be depressed? <laughs> Does it like to go up? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can absolutely, in their native environment, if they didn't find a tree to climb up or some other structure to wrap around, they do kind of sprawl out on the ground. The one thing that you do have to be careful with, especially kind of in my hot and muggy 
environments is that, you know, when they're, when they are touched on the ground, they have a lot of leaf mass. They have a lot of just vegetation associated with it. When they are grown horizontally, um, touching the ground, you can get into some issues pretty quickly with molds and mildews that build up. So that's a big, big reason why we like to trellis them vertically. Yeah, that makes sense. And then what are the challenges as far as like pests or disease that affect hops? So uh, downy mildew and powdery mildew are are pretty severe. We don't have as much uh, powdery mildew at my farm, but downy mildew, which it does become a systemic problem. It can get into the plant material and just kind of rear its ugly head every year. So that's kind of the number one um, disease that we struggle with. Uh, and then for pests, you know, there aren't, because it is a, a little bit strong smelling like herbs are, um, a, a lot of pests are deterred from it, but we do get, um, you know, Japanese beetles love to just eat the leaves. Uh, aphids can kind of take over. And there's these little spidery tick like bugs called spider mites, which just love to hang out on the underside of leaves. Um, they can be pretty bad. And then a recent pest that has kind of been scaring the hop world, at least in my my part of the neck of the woods, is this pest called a European corn borer. <laughs> mm. And it's a caterpillar that actually bites into the bind. And then once it's inside, the bind starts chewing its way up, effectively kind of um, disrupting the flow of nutrients and water to the top of the plant. Oh. That sounds like a disaster. That's, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was kind of a silent a silent killer for a little while. Um, we would just see, you know, we'd, we'd get to harvest season, the plants look gorgeous. And then we would just start to see from the top down, all of a sudden just browning and drying out inexplicably. Um, and it kind of took some head scratching. And one day I was out in the yard and I was just kind of looking at this vine, trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And I st saw this little hole with what is called frass, which is just like a fancy term for bug poop. <laughs> it looks like sawdust. Um, and I saw him, I start scratching and I notice there's a hole. I take out my knife from my pocket. I slice a slit in the vine and I see the most disgusting, wiggly, fat <gasps> caterpillar, just happy as a clam. <laughs> Oh my gosh, and it must it was, have been tiny. Was it tiny? They can actually get quite big because, you know, hot vines can easily be as thick or thicker than, than your fingers. Um, oh, wow. So it, oh. it's just, but they, the um, it's basically uh, born from a moth, a white moth that lays its eggs on the undersides of leaves. And the caterpillars hatch and they're so tiny. You, it's you're almost hard to see them with your naked eye. You almost need a, a microscope. And they just slowly start feeding, and then they just very quickly find their way into a bind um, before you really know what's going on. So that was one of our biggest hurdles to overcome. But once we figured it out, we established a lot of really handy tools to help us deal with it. Um, the biggest tool is actually using um, a really fancy weather station at the at the farm and calculating what we call degree days. So there's a lot of... Um, research done on this crop specifically for the Midwest and corn um, stalks where it, where it gets its name, the corn borer, because um, it's quite a destructive pest for that crop in the Midwest. So there's all this research done on, you know, what the weather needs to be like for them to hatch, what kind of conditions they thrive in. So having a localized weather station at the farm really helped us to hone in on when those conditions were ripe for them to A, arrive, uh, B, lay eggs and C, for those eggs to hatch and how long it would take them to mature enough to actually get inside the vine. So what do you do? So say that the conditions are right for them to come. We, we scream now. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do much when they arrive because they are a mm -hmm. moth and they fly predominantly at night. Uh, they like to stay covered, uh, so birds can't get them easily. So there's not much other than trying to trap them um, to do to deal with the adults. But once the eggs are laid, um, and again, we use kind of a computer model to help us with that, and then just good old-fashioned scouting, uh, looking for the eggs in the field, um, we like to release a parasitic wasp, which actually 
uh, parasitizes the eggs and doesn't let them hatch. So that's one kind of natural defense that we're using at the hop farm to kind of control this pest. Um, timing is very difficult and timing has to be very precise with some of these um, integrated pest management solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we also do rely on organic pesticides like BT, which is a natural um, soil uh, bacteria that actually can help break down the, the pest as well. Mm -hmm. It's a tough, it, that is really a tough um, challenge to have to deal with those because those different stages of life present a challenge for each one. Yeah. And like, like I said, you can't really do much, much about the moss and you absolutely mm -hmm. can do nothing once the, the caterpillar enters the stem. And you have 25 foot high yes. plants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. So that is, yeah, the last uh, four or five years that has been a big focus of, of how can we create these organic standard operating procedures that can deal with something as uh, insidious, if you will, as the corn borer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's challenging, right? It would be so easy just to spray it with some poison. Yes, absolutely. And that's, we actually did get a, a grant from the state of Maine to help us study and, and best figure out how to deal with this pest. So that was actually really, really helpful. It helped us pay for that fancy weather station I talked about. And it helped us just get in contact with some experts on this pest that were also a little bit shocked that we were seeing them in our hop yard. Yeah. Wow. They were like, they land there and say, it's Nirvana. They'll never find us in this yeah. forest. of. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So, and then, so say your hops plants are 25 feet tall and they're gorgeous. How long does it take for it, um, them to become mature to where you can harvest the plant? So we tend to harvest um, the end of September, sometimes into October, uh, just for my climate. Out West, it's a, a little bit different, a little bit earlier. So they do, like I mentioned, grow from nothing to 25 feet and are a harvestable plant all in one growing season. Of course, the more mature your, your hot plant is, meaning how many years has it been growing for, uh, will kind of impact how big and bushy it gets. But even when we plant a rhizome for the first year, that plant is still going to grow as tall as we let it. It just won't be as full. So we usually... We usually say it takes about three years for a bind to reach its, uh, you know, prime maturity. And within about 10 years, you know, five to 10 years, we try to um, pull up old rhizomes and replant just to maintain that vigor. This plant is amazing. I had no idea. And do you know, what is it that gives hops its unique and distinctive bitter flavor? Do you know what that is in the plant? So that's part of the, the alpha beta acids associated with the, the lupulin. Um, and each, each variety has its own unique kind of range of that. Um, but again, the same variety grown at different places will register differently. So it is common for hops that we picked. We do send some to the lab to get analyzed so that when brewers do come to us, that's something that they're very keen on knowing uh, because that dictates part of their brew process. Um, so it's really good to kind of have a, a baseline that we can, it's kind of like farmers and brewers being able to communicate on the, in the same language uh, when we talk about kind of these alpha and beta acids. So uh, it just gives us a common language, but it is really important to them, more so to them than it is to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think it's funny whenever uh, I tell someone I grow hops, they go, oh, so you make beer. <laughs> and I absolutely, I don't know very much about brewing other than, <laughs> than the basics. <laughs> you know, I, I tell them, no, I don't make beer. I grow beer. Because <laughs> <laughs> hops really is that distinctive beer, bitter flavor. Absolutely. And, you know, especially with the kind of craze these days for like really, really hoppy IPA style beers, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of put hops into a uh, into the into the show light that they normally were thought of just kind of a, a side ingredient or uh, serve some sort of antiseptic purpose for travel. Um, 
but nowadays it is very much focused on the actual flavor profile of that hop and how can brewers kind of maximize it for the, like the most you know cloudy hazy juicy ipa uh that brewers like to talk about so much <laughs> i bet you hear a lot of that talk <laughs> oh it's so you know i i love brewers they're they're all very a lot of them are very unique people who are just so enthusiastic about this crop so it's it's fun to be able to like share that excitement with people but then at the same time they're looking at it so from such a different perspective than I am and it's just it's funny to see those two worlds meet how do you know when it's ready to harvest we talked about how long it takes like how can you tell yeah and that's actually a pretty tricky thing because what you're really looking for and especially for kind of long term storage of your hops to keep selling throughout the year to brewers it really depends on kind of the moisture content of that cone so we actually you know a few weeks leading up to harvest we very regularly analyze the moisture content of each variety uh, and when it hits that sweet spot then we know it's time to start picking there's also um, people will look at the actual lupulin like on with a microscope and there's a certain shape it takes when it's like at its maximum maximum oil content, so to speak. So using both like visual cues and, you know, I, I like to rely on more of the analy analytic analytical mm -hmm. tools. <laughs> um, they tell us a story of when they're ready. I think uh, for new farmers and even for people growing hops at home, the absolute trickiest thing is to know when they're at their prime. Mm -hmm. um, and it, It's it, an art, I bet. It, it's an art and it just takes a lot of practice. Um, and, you know, you can kind of go by feel, by smell. These are all kind of cues that you can kind of put together to to see okay does it smell a little grassy meaning it's still a little fresh it's still a little green and then as it starts to mature and dry out a little bit then you'll get those more intense maybe citrus notes or pine notes um, and then you're like okay time to go wow how fascinating you know I loved a description of um, hops in a book I was reading a plant book and it said the little balls of aromatic oil, the lupulin, when you pinch one and it's ripe, the glands break open. I thought that is so interesting. And then that oil's released. Does that sound right? Absolutely. They kind of, mm -hmm. like, when you look at it under, uh, with like a hand lens or a microscope, it, it starts as like this flat disc. And then as it, it, it matures and the oil content grows, it starts to kind of almost mushroom out. So you can look for that specific shape to help give you an idea of, hey, you know what, this might be ready. How fascinating. So cool that, that those chemicals in plants are what give us the aroma and the flavor and that the growing conditions affect those. Absolutely. And it, it's, it's, you know, I'm always tempted because they, they, they <laughs> I do have to admit, they smell a lot better, better than they taste right off the plate. <laughs> I definitely like popped a few in my mouth and it's so astringent um and it makes you so thirsty <laughs> oh my so it's gosh. much better processed in some sort of way than than fresh. i bet yeah because it's so bitter right just on its own and a lot of herbal formulas which we'll talk a bit about that in a minute will say blend hops with something else or yeah. only take it in tincture or capsule because you cannot just take it in you know in i mean your mouth. really really intense people can <laughs> if they're trying to prove a point maybe but yeah I think that generally that's good advice <laughs> <laughs> and then I did read that you can eat the young shoots like asparagus yes, have you ever tried that I have um actually it's a common practice at the farm so when you we first see these shoots emerge from the ground we commonly do what we call a first cut so we'll cut these tender shoots down again and let them regrow and what that does is it kind of starts the clock at the same time for all the plants so rather having one plant emerged a little bit earlier it's two feet taller we kind of want a, as uniform as possible so we'll, we'll actually go through and cut those shoots um, and we absolutely we put them in eggs we like to pickle them um, there's all sorts of fun ways to eat them and like you said it's it's similar enough to the taste of asparagus if you will but you do have to get them when they're quite young because if you do let them grow a little bit too mature and try to eat them you get that prickliness uh that we've talked yeah. about and it's quite unpleasant 
<laughs> yes, I've had that in my hands from squash. Ugh. Yes. <laughs> it's like, I know you're in there, but where are you? I can't see anything. <laughs> you know, it's just like micro cuts. Like it's nothing yes. big, but after, you know, you, you're playing in the hops for long enough and you come out and your arms are just, it just destroyed. Oh. Wow. Hops. It's the dark side of hops. <laughs> it is. And they're so itchy <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> that That's when you need a beer or like a hops bath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And so, um, I read too, I just researched, it was so interesting to read about hops, so I kind of overdid it, but <laughs> I read that. <laughs> <Easy to do. laughs> I know, it's just, I love reading about plants. It's like my favorite thing, but so harvesting hops, I read was, right, you're talking about how your arms get cut up. It seems a little challenging, and I read that workers used to wear stilts to pick them. I mean, that makes <laughs> sense because they are so tall. We do have um, modern ways to deal with that mm -hmm. now. Um, so you don't but have it to is, wear stilts? It, yeah, it is quite the production and, you know, large scale commercial farms have mm -hmm. got it down to a T. Uh, on our farm, you know, we're still a little bit small for the investment in technology required to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, but we tow a hay trailer behind a tractor and in the back of the hay trailer, we have scaffolding built. Um, so someone actually stands up there. It's all safe. Don't worry. <laughs> Someone stands on top of the scaffolding with um, electric shears. And as the um, tractor goes down the row, the person at the top kind of cuts the top of the crop. And there's two people at the front of the hay trailer guiding the binds in so that they fall flat. And then once we get, you know, 100 pounds or so of hot binds, which isn't actually that much because they're quite hefty plants. We'll bring the tractor to our hop picker, which is a, um, adorably named Helga because she came from Germany. Um, and it's this series of, of belts and pickers. And we attach a bind to this hook that kind of strings the plant through this complex um, system within the machine and out from a conveyor belt spits. Uh, the freshly picked hops, which we have a few people on hand just doing quality control, making sure no big leaves are in there. But it is quite, uh, if you were to do it by hand, it is uh, exhaustive. Oh, I uh, bet. Hand picking hops is, is, it will take you days and days and days and days for just a few plants. Oh my gosh. And are you just picking the flower then, the flower head kind of? or? Yeah, we call them cones. Um, so yes, we, we are just after the cone, um, when we're talking about like hops for beer production or really hops mm -hmm. for tinctures for anything, uh, what spits out at the other end of, of Helga is, um, the, the binds themselves. And usually there's about three to four binds per, um, string that kind of all wrap around each other. And what we do is we either, uh, in some years we've had to burn the debris because we are worried about pest um, establishing in the yard, that corn borer that first year we had an infestation. Um, we just we didn't want to take any chances um, that they would overwinter in our compost pile, but we traditionally like to compost them. Uh, we have a few local people in the community that come by and pick them up for wreath making. Um, we've had people come by and take the excess for wedding decorations. Um, so, you know, people have found a lot of use for the entire plant, but our focus has always been on the cones. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I read too, that you can make a dye, a natural dye out of at least the leaves and the flower heads, I think. I can, I can believe that because it is quite an oily plant, um, even the leaves kind of have this quality to them of the sheen, um, and they're this deep, deep deep green um, that that I could see could make a lovely dye. And then are you, so you harvest it, you have your um, flower or the cones, and then are you selling those to brewers? Are you drying them? Are you selling them fresh? How does that work? Yeah, so uh, a new phenomenon or newer phenomenon that's really kind of taken the beer world by storm is what we like to call a fresh hop beer. So trad traditionally hops were dried, uh, pelletized, and then used in a brewery. But uh, with, the, with the rise of hop farms, local hop farms, uh, breweries that get to take advantage of, as soon as that hop is picked from the plant, within 12 hours, 
um, it can be in a brew kettle. Wow, that's amazing. As a, as that's a whole, fast. Yeah, it's super fast. It's a whole wet hop cone, um, and it, it brings unique taste to the beer. Um, it's a little bit greener, a little pinier. Uh, there's all sorts of theory and technique that brewers have, have established. Um, it, the craziest of one is is putting the whole cones in a vat of, of liquid nitrogen and flash freezing it and then beating it up. So all that lupulin glands freeze instantly and then are beaten up and then drop out. So it's kind wow. of produces a like a super concentrated hoppy beer. <laughs> um, super lupulin. Exactly. Uh, but traditionally, they are dried and we have this dryer on site, which is a refabbed um, tractor trailer, um, you know, truck. And we force in hot air at a really low temperature or, you know, depending on how many hops are in there, it could be 12 hours to 24 hours and we dry it. And again, we're really focused on that specific moisture content. Um, and once it reaches that, we put it into what we call a cure room. So we like to pile the hops up into a giant heap. Uh, you know, it's bigger than me. It's quite fun. <laughs> um, and we let it sit there for a little while to kind of homogenize. So, you know, maybe one corner of, of our uh, kiln is a little hotter than another corner. So kind of piling it all into one helps it even out. Um, and then once that's done, we actually bale them up. So we put the dried cones in. It's basically like a gigantic trash compactor. Um, so we fill them and then we bring this heavy arm down and smush it as tight as we can. And we do that over and over again until we fill up a bale that weighs about, you know, a hundred, anywhere from 130 to 180 pounds. Oh my gosh. And we sew it up old fashioned with like <laughs> upholstery needles. Um, and then the, the issue we have on the East coast is there aren't, there is not a facility cut out to do the actual pelletization. Um, it's a big facility that would require millions of dollars that just because hop growing on the East Coast is still relatively, it's it's new old. So it, it happened here a long time ago before prohibition. It was kind of the one, you know, one of the biggest hop producers uh, New England was in the nation. Then prohibition hit. Um, as well as some molds and mildews that, that beat us back. And that's when the whole hop industry moved out west. And because of that, we don't have the infrastructure uh, that's needed to completely process the, the final product. So we actually have to train our bales of hops back to Washington and Oregon, where those facilities do exist. Oh, wow. And the processing is actually finished there. So there is a big movement to try to get the infrastructure we need um, locally, but it will take a, a collaboration uh, between state and many, many farmers. And uh, it just hasn't been, uh, unfortunately, a big enough priority <laughs> for the God, people. You think now, <laughs> that's a good business opportunity, right? It, right it, there. it is, but the, uh, the buy in cost is just so extravagant. And that's what's really keeping somebody from being successful. Well, if anyone's listening and <laughs> wants wants to be surrounded by hops and lives on the East Coast <laughs> and loves beer, <laughs> are there two kinds of hops, alpha and aroma? Have you heard of that? Yeah, and that, that does refer to kind of that, that um, what it's used for. So one's a bitter and one's a, mm -hmm. a, a smell. Ah, okay, gotcha. So certain hops lean one way towards the other. Mm-hmm. And depending on, and that's why we kind of uh, do put a few hops through analysis to figure out what that hop can do for a brewer. So they know more what its natural tendency or how. Yeah, tendency that, or cap. Yeah. Yeah, how that will impact the taste of a beer. If it's a bitter, you're you're using maybe less to produce a certain taste. Where if it's an aroma hop, that's where you're getting like these big juicy tropical you know these are all the buzzwords that brewers use um, that comes from like the aroma hops oh, so that's so kind of like on the nose when you when mm -hmm. you put the beer up to your mouth and you start drinking those aroma hops are what's going to hit you first oh that's so cool and so um what are a couple of your favorite varieties of hops 
I think what my one of my favorites that we have at the yard, we have a little experimental trellis, and we don't actually know what this hop is, is truly called. We call it Maine Wild because it was kind of found, and we just planted it. But it's 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 one of our more robust plants, um, and it just it it just grows phenomenally. Um, I think my other favorite hop from last year is called Comet, and my second favorite would be Nugget which is very, our, our nugget, um, is very, it almost smells like Skittles to me, (laughs) (laughs) but on the West coast, it's completely different and it's more like piney and evergreeny. So that's just, it's just amazing how, how they can be so different. Wow. It's so fascinating. And so I read too, in the research that there, that hops can be a fire hazard. Have you heard of that? Oh, (laughs) I've seen it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> why um, tell us how and how how does that work so it's similar to um like bales of hay mm-hmm. so if you were to bale hay that's a little bit too wet it kind of and they're all stacked up on top of each other they can start to rapidly decompose and through that process they generate a lot of heat and can actually spontaneously combust um, yeah, and that's why really? barn fires were such a uh, a big scary deal um back in the day when there was more barns filled with hay, um, but a big pile of hops on the ground. So even when we're picking and processing, we have to constantly be clearing the debris coming out of the machine because if it does pile up too much, um, it, it, you can fit, you, you put your hands in and it's physically hot. You pull leaves out and they're charred. Um, so we have to be very diligent to make sure that that, that pile up of debris is never too big and to certainly not leave it overnight. Wow, that's and why is this? Why does it do this? It's the it's the sheer amount of organic material and the moisture within it, creating kind of this rapid decomposition um, that can happen. Wow, so that's something good to know. <laughs> yeah, and it's through that decomposition that that heat's generated. Mm-hmm. So just like a normal compost pile, they can get quite warm, um, but just the nature. There's so much organic matter uh, with a hot bind. That if it does, you know, if a small spark does ignite, um, it it can it can be a problem. A lot of the times, though, when it it is freshly harvested, there is they are so wet and have so much moisture. A lot of time, you won't get like a, a big flash fire. You'll just get this like very slow uh, smoldering going on. And so I. I think leftover hops too are used for all sorts of things like mushroom substrate. And I think you can put it in your worm bin and feed it to your worms and great for compost. I haven't tried that. I haven't tried Mm -hmm. the vermicompost food, but we do have um, a a, a very large compost pile that uh, (laughs) the hops definitely uh, contribute to quite a bit. Uh, One of the problems we've found though, trying to compost the hops is the bind is so fibrous. So like you mentioned, it is related to, to cannabis. And, you know, one of those relatives is hemp, which is uh, used for fiber. So the bind itself is, is very tough and uh, very slow to break down. So we're trying different experiments on, you know, you know, chipping the bind first, shredding it, trying to uh, mechanically break it up a little bit before we try to compost it. Well, you mentioned people using it for reeds, and then it, I also read that people can use it for fiber and paper making. Absolutely. And that, yeah. That makes sense with how fibrous you said it was. Oh, yeah. It is, it is so tough. Like if you were to wrap a bind around your hand and try to pull it apart, you're not going to have much luck. <laughs> so maybe a good material. I, I think it's not as like easy to work with is hemp, but that might be a good source of fiber for clothes. I think, I think it absolutely could. It will all, it will always come down to, and this is something that hemp has been struggling with now that it's become more mainstream is, is that processing again. It's, there's not quite the infrastructure in place yet to deal with these fibrous plants on a large scale. So that's kind of putting, putting a damper on being able to use the plant all of its parts. Right, right. God, hopefully that will happen soon because I would love to see polyester replaced by hemp and hops. That would be awesome. (laughs) (laughs) It would be heaven. So is there anything else you want to share with listeners about growing hops? 
I would just like to say, you know, if, if you do live in a place where there is a hop farm nearby or somewhere you can drive to um, and they and they do welcome visitors, I would definitely say it's worth checking out because it is one of those crops that you see and your jaw does drop because it is just so it's just out there. There's not much there's not much there's not many farms that look like a hop farm and to see it in person is really kind of awe inspiring. Oh, I I wish I could grow it here. I don't, I have sun, but not full sun all day. So I don't know if it would thrive, but I'm inspired to try and grow it since I've talked to you. I think it's all, it's always worth a try. If it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. at least, at least you gave it a shot. Exactly. And so one thing I did want to mention is that hops does have a lot of um, history as a medicinal er plant. And it's known as a nerve tonic. It has a relaxing effect on our nervous system. And it really helps with insomnia and sleep and restlessness, anxiety, as well. as So it has those calming effects. And then it also is a digestive nervine, which helps with the bitters is one of the most potent digestive bitter. Do you have anything to add to those medicinal uses? I do know that I like to make a hoppy tea uh, mm -hmm. around bedtime. I do find that it is kind of similar to chamomile. In fact, sometimes I, I make a mixture of both. Um, it, it does have this just soothing kind of relaxing quality without being groggy, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. I know, nice for relaxing in the evening. And I did read that there is a contraindication that if you do suffer from depression, you probably don't want to be taking hops. Because oh, that's, I think, that they yeah. really, um, don't mesh well together. Mm -hmm, exactly, because I think hops can really just maybe bring you too much calm. And then if you're already suffering from depression, it might be too much. Um, oh, and then, so you make tea. So you just make the tea like a regular herbal tea? Yep. So if I have mm -hmm. like um, tea bags that I usually put loose leaf tea in, uh, I'll either put um, either dried hops or when it's harvest season, I have no shame in just putting whole hop cones in a warm, warm glass of water. <laughs> oh, that sounds wonderful. And I, I also read, we were talking about it earlier, about a bath and a foot bath that you can do. Yes, I'm going to have to try that. Yeah, I bet it really, it will put you into to the land of sleep probably pretty quickly because it, it really is an effective herb for sleeping, I guess. Yeah. And there's if, if, if listeners out there aren't too keen on alcoholic beverages, because obviously beer is the most notable beverage that hops are used in. There's um, a lot of new products coming out like hop seltzers, hop waters that are infusing non-alcoholic beverages with kind of the same um, municipal properties that you can get from hops, but without the alcohol. So oh, I'd say great. if you're not a beer drinker, but still are curious on what hops taste like, kind of seek out some of these other forms that hops are being infused into. It, hops time has come. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. No. <laughs> I know it's it's not a new plant. It, it's been around for thousands of years, but um, still, it's great and exciting. And it was so fun to learn about it with you, Acadia. And where can people find you online? Uh, so they can go to my website, which is just AcadiaTucker.com. Um, they can check out the Hop Yard website, which is just thehopyard.com. Um, and you can see some of the articles and uh, purchase books that I've written online at stonepeerpress.org. Great. And your books really will help people in growing hops once they get their rhizomes in the mail. Absolutely. And, and kind of growing it with, with that regenerative twist that's so important. Thank you so much. It was really, you know, it's always fun chatting with someone about hops. So thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. That was so fun. <laughs> no, I always love chatting with you. You're so easy. <laughs> you are too. <laughs> Sometimes I know it's real. I really appreciate you saying that because sometimes it doesn't feel that easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's all the hops you've been around. <laughs> yeah, it put me in a, la a relaxing state. <laughs> yeah, when you quit, if you ever quit the hops farm, and then I talk to you, you'll be like, okay, let's get down to business. Yeah, <laughs> A B C D, let's go. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, this was so wonderful. Have a great weekend. You too. I always, I, like I said, I always love chatting with you. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report. 
The Plant Report is produced by Jill Cloutier and is a project of Sustainable World Radio. For more podcasts about plants, permaculture, and ecology, visit our website, sustainableworldradio.com, and you can also find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. The Plant Report is created for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any health condition. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to thank the plants for everything they do.